Uh, today is uh, Saturday, February 4th, uh, 2017. Uh, this will be our last Tay Show until the uh, 18th of February. Uh, Rose and I will be uh, doing our Jataka session in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica at Casa Zen uh, with Sinyana Roshi and the uh, Sangha down there uh, over the next few weeks. So um, I'd like to uh, explore today uh, another uh, Jataka tale, an important one, but an unusual one. This comes from the Nepalese Jataka tradition, uh, <clears throat> and it's set quite long ago, world ages ago. We, we, we say in our opening the Dharma chant or recitation, the Dharma, incomparably profound and minutely subtle, is rarely encountered, even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. A kalpa is the uh, said to be the time it takes for a deva wearing a silken robe, flying down, let's say, from the heavens uh, to Mount Everest, once every hundred years, brushing the top of Mount Everest with the silken sleeve of his or her robe. A kalpa is the length of time it would take for Mount Everest to be worn down uh, to sea level uh, with one brush of a silken sleeve every hundred years. Uh, interesting that uh, Asian traditions have a sense of geologic time. Uh, it's truly vast. Uh, this Jataka tale presented by the Nepalese tradition place a very long time ago, hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas, yet is uh, completely relevant to our minute-by-minute -minute practice uh, today, as you'll see. So <clears throat> uh, I will be reading from The Hungry Tigress, uh, the completely revised and expanded edition, Buddhist myths, legends, and Jataka tales, uh, told by my uh, book written by myself, uh, and <clears throat> published by Yellow Moon Press in 1999. Uh, there were several editions of this uh, book, but this is the most complete one. Uh, uh, some of the earlier editions, there was one from Shambhala in 1984, uh, another from Parallax, but neither of them, the first one was completely different. It was, uh, didn't have any commentaries, was only half the length. Uh, the second one was really not that complete. Um, this is the most complete edition. So let's see. Um, the Jataka is uh, the first in uh, yeah, the first in the book, The Hungry Tigress, the 1999 edition from Yellow Moon. It's a very short Jataka. It goes like this. Once, many long ages ago, or could go like in a time beyond all reckoning, uh, the Buddha was a king named Suprabhasa. One day this king, Suprabhasa, told his elephant trainer to ready the great white elephant so he might ride. My lord, replied the trainer, I cannot bring him. The great white elephant has broken his golden chains and gone back to the jungle. It is only temporary, being the time of his rut. He will return. He is well trained. The king, disappointed, lost all self-control and shouting at the trainer, angrily dismissed him. The next morning, the elephant trainer again came before the king and announced, my lord, it is as I predicted. The great white elephant has returned. The training was good. We have conquered over his old wild ways. Shades of the ox herding pictures, actually. Those words touch the king's own fault. Though I am king, he suddenly realized, holding great power over others, I have as yet failed to conquer what is closest, myself. I was not even able to control my own anger. This will not do. Tell me, trainer, he now asked, are there any who have truly conquered themselves? The harder it must be, it now seems to me, to conquer oneself than to control an elephant in the time of its rut. 
My Lord, answered the trainer, there are the conquerors, the Buddhas. Having triumphed over all greeds and desires, over all anger, hatred, and fear, they must surely be the noblest of all beings. Free from self-centered delusions, they live in peace, seeing things as they really are. At once, a great yearning, like a fire, arose in King Superboss's heart. A yearning to conquer himself and be free. In this way, Shakyamuni, the Buddha of our own age, many long ages ago, first awake, first awoke to what was to be an ever deepening longing for wisdom and truth. <clears throat> Let's see, there's a note uh, I wrote for this, or some notes. Uh, let's see what these notes say, if there's anything relevant. Us now. <clears throat> uh, references to this little known Jataka appear in several different, differing versions. Uh, uh, they're all Nepali. I have not come across any versions in the Pali Jataka literature, but only in the Nepalese. Still, it remains an interesting story. Uh, there is a psychological acuity to this brief tale with his images of elephant training giving rise in the king's mind to a desire for freedom from his own half-realized life. And it marks the conscious beginning of the Buddha-to-be's religious career. The training path of the Bodhisattva literally means wisdom being. This is where it all begins, according to the Nepalese tradition, with a king who is egotistic, discovering, realizing for the first time that though he controls others, he can't even control himself. And it stunned him. This gives us hope for things we're seeing in our own culture in our own time, perhaps. One never knows how someone might suddenly discover how unfree they are, even when they have tremendous power. This is right there in Buddhist tradition. So the training path of the Bodhisattva will now, from that moment, extend, according to traditional sources, through four inconceivable periods, a total of four times three times 10 to the 51st, 51st power times 320 times 10 to the six years, or four times 960,000 million, billion, 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 billion years. An unimaginably long, and so for all ordinary purposes, endless period of time. Uh, the path of the Bodhisattva uh, requires dedication, uh, perseverance, persistence. It's endless. It's endless because it's timeless. In the cosmic mythic language of the Indian imagination, we are being told that this is an eternal time transcending effort. And because this is so, it is not an exertion one makes in the future. It is the exertion one makes now. We're all like that king. And our moment is now to realize more deeply. The 12th century Zen master Dogen, one of the greatest of all the Japanese Zen masters, 12th and 13th actually, maybe 13th is more accurate, described this path as one of sustained exertion and added that to attempt to avoid exertion is an impossible evasion, for the attempt itself is exertion. You can't avoid the work of becoming a conscious human being. The very effort to avoid the work is work. To quote Dogen fully, or more fully, the great way of the Buddha involves the highest form of exertion, which goes on unceasingly in cycles from the first dawning of religious truth. It is sustained exertion proceeding without lapse from cycle to cycle. It is through the sustained exertions of the Buddhas and patriarchs that our own exertions are made possible, that we are able to reach the high road of truth. In exactly the same way, it is through our own exertions that the exertions of the Buddhas are made possible that the Buddhas attain the high road of truth. 
Thus, it is through our exertions that these benefits circulate in cycles to others, and it is only due to this that the Buddhas and patriarchs come and go, attaining Buddha mind, achieving Buddhahood ceaselessly and without end. This exertion, too, sustain, sustains the sun, the moon, and the stars. It sustains the earth and sky, body and mind, object and subject. It sustains the four elements and the five compounds. This sustained exertion is not something which people of the world naturally love or desire, yet it is the last refuge of all. So that was said by some master Dogen in the 13th century of Japan. <clears throat> and uh, one more quote uh, from the Buddhist monk poet Saigyo, uh, also 12th century Japanese. Uh, the mind for truth begins like a stream, shallow at first, but then adds more and more depth while gaining greater clarity. And finally, a quote from Yasutani Roshi, who is Robert Aiken Roshi's teacher and Kapla Roshi's teacher. Uh, and you'll see his picture over there with the pictures of teachers behind this zendo. Man fancies himself to be the most highly evolved organism in the universe. But in the view of Buddhism, he stands midway between an amoeba and a Buddha. So uh, that's uh, excerpts from the notes uh, that are in the Hungry Tigress on this story, but let's jump on. Uh, this Jataka shows the first moment of the Buddha's awakening to his own fundamental aspiration to overcome self-centeredness. It is the story of an ordinary person awakening to the way. Of course, a king is not an ordinary person. In many cultures, royalty is regarded as semi-divine. So a king is at the top of worldly life. That, yet that is no guarantee of security. The wheel turns, empires crumple, and rulers fail. There is nothing wrong with success. The issue is thinking we're beyond the turning of the wheel of life when we're not. Then a false sense of security and entitlement can lead us astray. Hakuin spoke bluntly to the nobility of his time, warning them, that the good karma that had brought them high could quickly turn to very bad karma if they acted selfishly. The Bodhisattva king in this Jataka catches himself acting crudely and egotistically and starts to correct it. But then his response becomes deeper and more interesting. When he catches himself acting self-centeredly, giving way to anger, he moves from why can't I control those around me, to why can't I control myself, to how does one control oneself, and even it seems to what is this self that needs controlling. As a king, someone with power over others, the bodhisattva's natural koan arises in terms of power and control. That question, what is the self that needs controlling, becomes a turning point, a moment of ripened karma. The Buddha, though a king, in this Jataka is an ordinary, unawakened person. But for an instant, he glimpses the empty ground on which we all stand, and it shakes him to the core. According to the Nepalese Jataka tradition, this is where the entire Jataka path begins. It is where Zen begins too, for it is where Buddhism becomes personal. As Dogen says, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. What could be more personal? It is not simply about worshiping Buddhas or gaining better beliefs, helpful as such things might be, they just make actual on the mat and in the Doksan room practice realization possible. Dogen says to study the self is to forget the self. K. 
can our compulsive fascination with this thing we call ourselves be forgotten? There's one way to find out. The way to study the self is to practice. In practice, we see the self arising, coming, going, coming apart, fading away. We find it is more porous than we thought. We find it insubstantial, vast and empty from the start, vast and empty right now as it arises and grips us again. But Dogen clarifies the practice of realization even further. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things. This is the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, seeing the morning star. This is a morning star awakening under the Bodhi tree. This is practice realization. Dogen then brilliantly adds a further pointer to beyond even that. When actualized by the myriad things, one's own body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drops away. No trace of enlightenment remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. Here is where even Shakyamuni is only halfway there. That's how endless endlessly is. It is not simply about extending forever in time. It is about beginning with this very breath. Endlessness is an ordinary ethical life no longer burdened with thoughts of me in here and you out there. Not boxed into self and other, enlightenment or unenlightenment. I've got it. I don't have it. A self that gets angry, a self that controls that anger. This selfless practice, Dogen says, continues endlessly. We no longer live crammed inside a tiny shoebox called myself. Dogen sets out the whole path of the Bodhisattva, the entire way of Zen, all the oxiding pictures in these few clear sentences. The king in this little jataka will one distant day be the fully enlightened Buddha of our time. Now, rather than remaining stuck in anger and pride, he finds himself on new ground. Touched by humility and openness, he drops the issue of the missing elephant and his ride and instead quietly and humbly asks for advice from his own employee. He suddenly sees that an elephant trainer must know about control. After all, he trains huge elephants. So the king asks if the trainer knows of anyone capable of controlling themselves. He's not talking about iron-willed self-control or repression. He's looking into the nature of the self that needs control, discipline, or what we might call training. Maybe he's sensing that conquering the self by the self might be a dualistic snare. That is not the same as the Buddha work of conquering one's ancient, habitual self-centeredness by what Dogen called the practice of studying the self. Freedom is in Zen is freedom from the self, not freedom for the self. There are many who imagine that freedom means doing what you want when you want. Such kings and queens, we meet them every day or read about them in the news, or indeed sometimes we are them, throw tantrums and wallow in anger when they don't get what they want, hurting others and themselves. But like the Buddha, if our karma is ripe and practicing ripens our karma, we can catch ourselves in the midst of errors. Then it's just this breath, this count, this dropping of all limited concepts of this body and mind. The mind road is abandoned 
as we focus on one breath, one koan. Even anger can be selfless and pure. A wave that washes through and is gone. Kanon has a wrathful face as well as ropes to tie up egotism. As practitioners, our job, like this king, the Buddha, so long ago, is to catch ourselves. Even as we fall into error, flames of self-centeredness arise. And right there's our opportunity. As Zen practitioners, our job is to do it each time we slip up. Our job is to allow konon, konzeon, day and night, to catch us and restrain our childish impulse to take out on the world and on others the egotistic, infantile rage that arises when we don't get what we want when we want it. Whenever we find ourselves falling into such behavior, we can recall this jataka. It encourages us, uh, encourages us to take hold of this moment as an opportunity to enter the way and look again into the root of our discomfort. Not just, why do I get enraged? Is it my mother's fault, my father's? But to step beyond psychology, beyond mindfulness is anger, 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 and leap into the flames and question, who is it that gets enraged? What is it that gets enraged? Looking directly, we can take the opportunity of our own errors to go deeper, as the Buddha himself does here. It can be the chance we need. We goof up often enough. Why not use our failures to enter the way? Practice means practice in the circumstances of ordinary life, not just in a zendo, not just in the doksan room. This is the challenge of the great way. We walk it by doing the work of letting self-centeredness go, openly seeing where we're at, and then stepping beyond to touch the ground of a greater reality. Little by little, our skills increase and our self-centeredness becomes less a habit. A king, the Buddha, in this Jataka set world ages ago, shows how it begins. That beginning can serve as a metaphor for each time it happens, reminding us to do it now. The Buddha didn't tell the story just so we can know what he did one time long ago. He told it to make us conscious of our own wasted opportunities. He told it so we can walk the path. As with koans, the point of jatakas is practice realization. The tales are not just history and not just pointers for future practice. They are not just told to honor the Buddha. That already distances us from them and from him. All the times we slip up are, because of this jataka, now practice opportunities. This is the Buddha's gift. He told the tale to help his sangha, which includes us now, to uphold the way and not let our many chances for deepened practice go by. So a king, back in a previous world age, wanted to ride his elephant. When he can't, he gets angry. What? I don't get what I want when I want it. What do you mean my car isn't ready? I left it with you two days ago. What? You haven't fixed my computer yet? It's been a week. Far in the future, one day to be Buddha throws a tantrum like a spoiled child. When a few days later, the trainer returns with good news, your elephant is back. You can ride whenever you want. As I said, he's well-trained. The king pauses. Well-trained, he thinks, catching a glimmer of something he's never seen before. The problem, he realizes, isn't controlling an elephant. It's not about arranging the world so it serves him. 
core of the problem comes down to controlling himself. He is a king, giving orders, controlling others, but can't control himself. It stuns him. We see his potential. He is a king, but is willing to call himself to task. How often does that happen? Tell me about these conquerors, he asks. He's not a bodhisattva yet. He's just a king without any great aspiration. But he realizes that controlling that fluid, unfindable, mysterious self, the meanness of me, is tougher than trying to control an elephant. Then, because he is a king, he decides that he must, he has to, as king, take up this challenge. Indeed, it's because he is king, wielding power, thinking he is in charge, that he can see that he's not actually as in charge as he thinks. He's not, because he's not in charge of what's closest, himself. His lofty place in life gives him the opportunity to see into the essence of his and our condition. Now he uses his privileged condition to go further or farther. The Nepalese Jataka tradition begins right here with the Bodhisattva's recognition of his own mistake and a failure. Failure gets him started on his endless path. It wasn't easy even for the Buddha. Why do we think it should be easier for us? We all have to start where we are. With this day, this session, this round of zazen, this breath, this koan, here is where truth becomes not an ideal, but real. What is it to be on the path of the conquerors, which is a traditional appellation for the Buddhas that conquer self-centeredness and delusion. What is it to be on the path of the conquerors? It is to realize that we each have the same brain, same body, same mind as previous Buddhas. The river flows for you and me as for fully realized Buddhas. The sun rises and sets for us as for them. The stars emerge out of darkness, the same for us as for them. Our bodies age and fade, the same as theirs. What can be more central than to know my own nature? What fame or wealth can compare to knowing the true nature of what I am? To know my place among stars, bugs, breaths, thoughts. What can compare to such knowing and dedicating myself to its fullest realization? How wonderful to know I was not born in vain. That I was not born just to gather this or that. Or to identify myself with this or that. Or to gain this or that to be seen or known for this or that. But I'm here to walk the endless path of practice realization together with all living things on this great earth. I am here to awake and rejoice. The Buddha was just like us. He reminds us that practice takes place right where we are, not in some special place. It is here even in our shortcomings, even in our failures. If our eyes are open, the important moment is always now. A self-centered king could see it ages ago. This is our potential too. Here is the message. It's not just what he did and how he did it, but how we can. The man who could give himself to his failure in time became the man who could leap, leap from a cliff to feed a tigress. Maybe we don't want to leap into a tigress's mouth. I don't. But I don't want to age and die either. I don't want to lose my hair. 
I don't want to need glasses, medications, hearing aids, and a cane. I don't want... Well, you get it. Starving tigress just makes it clear. Why was I born? Why must I age and die? There is always a tigress. And she is always hungry. We start each day where we are. We offer ourselves to this moment just as it is. This moment is when change occurs. The Buddha, long ago, caught himself about to take an old wrong road and found it could no longer satisfy him. Right in such moments, if we catch ourselves, we can wake out of an old dream and find a new road. Right when we realize we can't do it is exactly when we see that we can. Our error is our opportunity. That won't do. How do I do better is the beginning of the path that leads to above the heavens, below the heavens. I alone am the honored one. Even a future Buddha learns by experience. This important little tale shows us that the Buddha made mistakes. And by owning them, he grew and matured. He wasn't perfect. But his perfection showed itself in his willingness to continue doing his best each time. Aiken Roshi calls this the practice of perfection. Buddhist tradition does not infantilize us with belief in idealized perfection. It shows a person working. Actually, Buddhist tradition does not infantilize us with belief in idealized perfection. It shows a person working, struggling to embody a path of integrity. Conquerors conquered the ancient attachments to self-centered greed, anger, and ignorance. If we practice as they did, then we too can find this same freedom. Swaha, awake, rejoice.